Well, hello everyone and welcome once again. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, we're going to continue our teaching with what we've been talking about here, and that's the repair of the breach. Uh, before we get into some things today, though, I, I do want to make one announcement. Not so much an announcement, it, it, it's a thank you. And the thank you goes out, because of Mother's Day that we just had, the thank you goes out to all of the mothers out there, all of the women out there. You don't have to be a mom necessarily. Uh, there's many different ways of mothering, but you know, to all the moms, and including my own mom, uh, you know, it, 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 they're important. And you gotta realize, as women, what you can do. Uh, I, I know sometimes it looks a little bleak, and I've heard some, you know, not grumblings or complaining, but where do I fit in with this whole thing? Well, you know what? One of the biggest things that you can do as a mother is intercede, and it doesn't stop. I'm, I'm thankful that my mom still intercedes for me, my, so does my dad, um, but my wife intercedes, and the power of prayer that you can put up there. You know, I was middle of the night last night, both me and my wife were up three o'clock in the morning. Like, I'm not saying that like we're just like rolling around in bed, we're up, up. Like we're having a conversation at three o'clock in the morning, and this often happens. You know, and it's just, you know, you, you lay back down and you just start to pray again. And sooner or later, you know, you, you just, you, you get to it and then you can fall back asleep. But it's the power of prayer to intercede. Uh, there's going to be great ministries for, for ladies. It, it's powerful. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for, for being the moms. Thank you for being women of God. And that's what it all comes down to. We're, we're all children of the Almighty God and there's a role for all of us. And there's a way of ministering for all of us. Some, people, some of them will get behind uh, Bemas. Some of them will minister you know, unto each other, maybe run classes. You know, there's, there's all kinds of things that are going to happen as this thing develops, but right now we're still getting the men uh, involved, getting the men lined up uh, to be able to run this thing the way that God set His order to be able to run it. And that's important. But to all the women out there, to all the moms out there, well, happy Mother's Day and stick to it. You know, we go through Scripture and I was even, as I was doing my mikvah before I come up here, I started thinking about this, and you can look at, you know, the women of the Bible, and you look at, like, Eve. Okay, Eve, she screwed up. Then you look at somebody like Sarah. Well, we just went through things a few weeks ago as Sarah got herself in a whole lot of trouble, too. But you know what? Thank God for forgiveness. Because on the other side, you know, Abraham got himself in trouble. Moses got himself in trouble. Everybody got themselves in trouble. And... I hear it's echoing. I can't do anything about it. And even with David, David got himself in trouble. So thank, for forg thank God for forgiveness. But thank God for moms. Moms that'll stick to it, that'll plow through it, that'll make mistakes and come out on the other side. Watching their kids go through making mistakes and, and sticking to it and being determined and sticking to the prayer and holding fast on, on what the end result is. That's a mom. That's a mom. To lead, to guide, to help. That's a mom. And, and thank you, ladies, for being diligent. Thank you for your prayers. Thank you for interceding. There's some real prayer warriors that we have. Some real prayer warriors. And there's a couple that, I, that, that come off hand right, at the, right off the top of my head that I could, I could name. And, and I'm going to name them, actually. Okay. Miss Tony is, is a prayer warrior. And, and, and I know she is. My mother-in-law is an absolute prayer warrior. Irene, she's a prayer warrior. They go at it and they battle in the Spirit. And that's what this whole thing is about, is battling in the Spirit. And it doesn't take a man, it doesn't take a, a woman, it doesn't take a child. It can be any of the above. It's about being a child of the Almighty God. So, happy Mother's Day. Let's go to prayer and we're going to open up this thing about repair of the breaches. We're going to continue on here. Father, we, thank you, Father. Thank you for the things that you've given us, like the last breath of air that we took, Father, that we probably just took advantage of, that we probably don't even ever thank you for. The trees, the surrounding areas, the things that you've given us, Father. Everything we have comes through your hands, and we're grateful for that in which you have given to us. Right now, darkness, Satan, we take authority over you, we bind you in Yeshua's name. What's bound on this earth is bound in heaven itself. You don't have any right 
You try to steal, you try to kill, you try to destroy. Even the covenant, which we're going to be speaking of today. You try to get people off course, and you've done a good job. But we're here to be the repairers of the breach, of the infractions of the covenants, of the law of God. We release the power of the, the, the Rehokadosh, the Holy Ghost, to go forth. To open up the hearts for people to see. Open up the minds so that this material can get in and penetrate into their word and into their lives and get to, to the point where they open up their mouth. And that's what spews out, Father, is your words. We ask these things in Yeshua's name. Amen. So like we, we've been doing, we're going to open up and we're going to talk about Isaiah 58, 12. We're going to open up with that, with that verse because this is what this whole, the whole premise is of what we're dealing with is based on. Isaiah 58, 12. And your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, and you shall raise up the foundations of buildings that have laid waste for many generations, and you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. And your ancient ruins shall be built, for you shall raise up the foundations. What's the foundations? What's the foundation of our, of our walk with God? It's the covenants of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ, even as it says in Revelation. Now we went through all that. We're going to probably get into more of that today. The, build, the foundations of buildings that have laid waste. Because it sat there. It sat there and nobody did anything with it. And you can see that all the way through Scripture. Every example that we've used, they got away from the covenant, just kind of laid to waste. You can see the one time in Scripture where they actually pulled out the, the law of God and they dusted it off and said, what's this? Yeah, because it was what? It was, it was laying waste for many generations. And you shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to dwell in. You see, we go through this whole thing, and we're going to start off here in 1 Kings 8.3. And we've got a lot of Scripture again today, but we have to cover it because these are examples of what they've gone through already at one point in time of history. And we're just bringing forth the examples to see what God did back then. And we know that God is the same yesterday, today, and, and forever. But at the same time, we, we don't think that He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Because we think that somewhere along the, the, the way that He said that, stop keeping my commandments. Stop keeping my covenant. And a, a lot of people have, have heard this, and a lot of people have gone through this. And you, know, you go out there and you talk to anybody, and they're going to talk, about, they're going to talk over here about Paul. Well, Paul said... Well, Paul's not God, first of all. God said, God said, do you ever hear anybody say, well, Legion said. Well, Saul, when he was possessed with the demon, with, with the devil, he, well, he said, no, they've got to have a crutch. They have to go back to somebody. They go back to Paul. Because you know, Paul was a very astute man. Very, Paul knew the Word of God. Paul knew Torah. At the same time, Paul was extremely misunderstood. Paul was not in the, the rule-making business. Paul was in the problem-solving business. Paul was solving problems with the, the congregations in which he was dealing with. He was an apostle, and he was going around solving problems and writing letters to people as they wrote. And there were responses most of the time to problems that were coming at him, and word got back to him. And Paul's trying to just solve problems. It's just, slow down, guys, slow down. Youthful exuberance. And here Paul's just trying to back him off. And everybody takes it like, oh, well, Paul said that you don't have to keep the law. You don't have to keep the commandments of God. But he didn't say that at all. They would have killed him. They wanted to kill him, and they couldn't kill him over it. Because as a Pharisee, he took an oath. As a Pharisee, he took an oath. And if he would have broke the law, taught against the law, which is breaking the law, they could have killed him. He signed his, the consent form already. <coughs> Excuse me. And what happens, and what do you get out of that? A whole new doctrine, a whole new denomination, because somebody misrepresented Paul. I'm sure he's going to have some words to say, and he's got some fortitude. Don't forget, we're talking about a guy that went and stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and stood Peter right in the face. We know what Peter was like. So this guy's got some fortitude when he knows he's right. He's probably going to be standing a few people up in, in, in the face. So let's talk here about uh, in 1 Kings 8.3, and we're going we're gonna to get into some stuff about Solomon and how Solomon was, hey, walking with God. He went all the way through, and you know, God was happy with him, and then Solomon made some decisions. And isn't that exactly what we do with our foundations, with, with our walk? We make some decisions sometimes that 
you know, either pull a stone off the foundation or we build onto our foundation. And we've got to keep building and, and strengthening our foundation so that we can build this thing up to the heavens. Not the Tower of Babel. But build this thing and strengthen it so that it can expand. 1 Kings 8.3 I'm talking here about the ark being brought into the temple. All the elders of Israel came, and the priests took the ark, and they brought up the ark of the, the ark of the Lord, the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. The priests and the Levites brought them up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel who had assembled before him were with them before the ark, sacrificing sheep and oxen, so many that they could not be reported or counted. And the priest brought the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord to its place in the Holy of Holies in the house, under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim covered the Ark and its poles. The poles were so long that at the end of them were, were seen from the holy place before the Holy of Holies, but they were not seen outside. They, were there, they are there to this day. Interesting how it says that, that they are there to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, where the Lord made a covenant with the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. And you can find that over in Deuteronomy 10. But it's the same covenant that was made there that we're talking about now. 1 Kings 8.10 When the priest had come out of the holy place, the cloud filled the, the Lord's house, so the priest could not stand to minister because of the cloud, for the glory of the Lord had filled the Lord's house. And what's that mean when God does that? That means that God was happy. Because when God's happy with what you've done and you've pleased the Father, God is going to show His pleasure one way or another. You know, you, you see it after, after services, you see, after sermons, when, when things are done and God's happy, you see the miracles come. Because Scripture talks about it'll be followed what with signs and wonders. Confirming the Word, confirming the truth. And what was going on here was it was an absolute glorious time. But God wanted them to know that they were doing it right. They were doing something that pleased Him. Pleased Him. And what pleases God? Just doing what He said to do. You know, there's no commandment in Scripture about, you know, you have to fast, but you know what? It pleases the Father. It's like an offering. You're doing, you're, you're doing something beyond the, the command. We know that a tithe is, a, is, is part of the command. The blessing comes in the offering because there's no command to that. That's the heart. And when you're fasting, it's like an offering. And you're, you're offering that up to the Father. You're offering what? Your flesh up to the Father. And that he looks at and he says, okay, we got, some, we got somebody here. We see the heart, but why are you doing the fasting? And that's why we have to get back to making sure that we're doing the fasting right. Oftentimes we have, we have fasted, and we've all been guilty of it probably at one point in time, trying to force God's hand. That's not what Scripture talks about with fasting. It's about breaking things down, opening things up, tying up the spirit world, setting people free. This is the kind of fast that I want, it says in Scripture, and you can look that up. We've been talking about it for a couple of weeks now. But it's when God is pleased, God will show His pleasure to His people. Jump over here to Acts 1.14. We've got one verse there. If you don't want to jump there, that's fine. We're going to jump over to Acts 2 after that. Acts 1.14. All of these, with their minds in full agreement, devoted themselves steadfastly to prayer, waiting together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with all His brothers. Why? Because they were in accord. They were in one accord. And again, that makes God Happy. Happy. You can't force people to participate. But when everybody's heart is leaning towards the Father, it's pleasing to the Father. And it comes down to what? Praying, believing. Praying and believing. That's what our job is. Pray, believe, receive. And all this was going on here, what we're talking about here in Acts, it was during one of the feasts. Because what were they doing? Fulfilling one of His commandments again. So let's jump up back to, uh, or the, over to Acts 2.1. And when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all assembled together in one place. When suddenly there came a sound from heaven like rushing of a violent tempt, tempest blast, and it filled the whole house in which they were sitting. 
And there appeared to them tongues resembling fire, which were separated and distributed and which settled on each one of them. And they were filled, diffused throughout their souls with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in another foreign and different languages. As the Spirit gave them the clear and loud expression in each tongue in appropriate words. This happened all because of the fact that the Holy Ghost was sent back to the face of the earth. And it happened for a couple of reasons. One, obviously, because Jesus Christ said that He would send it back. He said that He would send the Comforter to lead you and to guide you into all truth. And the second part of that, they were in one accord and they were doing something on His feast day and God always makes His major moves on His feast day. The problem is, if you don't believe in the feast and that we have to keep the feast anymore, you're not going to be there to see anything because you don't even know when they're at. Jump to the negative? No, jump to the obvious. you got to be there to participate. you got to be there to participate. But again, everybody, you know, everybody loves participating in the 90 for some and the protection of God, and they love all that stuff, but they don't want to do the work to get there. They don't want to do what God says to get there, but the demand... God to show up when they demand God to show up. You see, it's not just incremental when you just decide and you need God to show up. I'm going to, you know, we go to a war as a country and the churches fill up. And then war's over, churches empty out. Well, what about those gaps there? That's one of these walks. And God needs you like this, steady on the tops of those hills, not on the bottom of those hills. He needs you steady at the tops of those hills, maintaining the gains, maintaining the cry out to, crying out to Him. That's what He needs. That's what He wants. And that's what is called what? Faith, faithfulness, being steadfast. Being steadfast, yeah. That's what God is really looking for out of your walk and out of your life. Let's go to 1 Kings 9, uh, verse 3. 1 Kings 9, verse 3. The Lord told him, I have heard your prayer and supplication which you have made before me. <laughs> Again, prayer and supplication. And what did he say? I have heard your prayer and supplication which you have made before me. Crying out. I have hallowed this house which you have built, and I have put my name and my presence there forever. Forever. My eyes, my heart, shall be there perpetually. Perpetually his eyes, and his heart. He's always looking out for his land, the land that he set aside for our forefathers, the land that was promised to us once again. But he heard his prayer and supplication. And if, there's those big little words, if you walk before me as David your father walked in integrity, and I want you to write that down, 1 Kings 9.4, and that that word integrity. We're going to talk about that a couple times here today. Integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you, keeping my statutes and my precepts. In order to have integrity, this is he's given a definition of what integrity is and, and how to maintain integrity. Integrity of heart and uprightness, doing all according to that I have commanded you, keeping my statutes and my precepts. You see, your integrity, and I do this when I you know, talk to, to guys in, about ministry, integrity has to be above and beyond everything else. Everything else. Because integrity goes back to what? Keeping his, his statutes, keeping his precepts. Because you can't be walking in sin and ministry and thinking that God's going to bless on the other side. No, it's about integrity. Integrity has got to be above everything else because you've got to set the standard. You've got to set the standard for others to follow. And it comes down to integrity. You see, look at Solomon here, though. Solomon had integrity at one point. Solomon had everything. He had, every, he had the whole world in his hands. He was probably the richest person on the face of the earth. We know it says in Scripture that he was the wisest person on the face of this earth. But what happened to Solomon? Solomon got tangled up with the ladies. 
Solomon got tangled up with ladies, the ladies that he shouldn't have got tangled up with. Because what he do? He broke the integrity rule, he broke the statutes, he broke the precepts, and he started marrying outside of the tribes. Therefore, he cashed in his integrity. You can't cash in your integrity and think that God can sit there and continue to bless. Integrity has got to be above and beyond everything else. You see, what God wanted, though God wanted him to follow after him, follow after his ways, after the ways in which his father did. Did his father screw up? Yeah, but thank God for his, his mercy. He had forgiveness. He cried out to God and asked, begged forgiveness. And that's all he wanted. He wanted him to have that hurt. But his hurt started to turn a little bit, didn't it? Because what happened? Well, Solomon just thought maybe, maybe, maybe he was just a little bit better than everybody else. A little higher than everybody else that, oh, I did all this for God, so I can do what I want to do. Possibility exists, doesn't it? A little heavy, heady, high-minded? Thinks that he can get out there in front of, the, in front of God? Well, I've got all this stuff. I've got all this wealth. I've got all this, this women. I've got all this smarts. I've got everything. And you know what he missed? He made the dumbest move that he could have made. He broke his integrity rule. Married outside the tribes. You know, it's like, you, you have to do it God's way. You have to do it God's way. 1 Kings 9.5 Then I will establish, establish your royal throne over Israel forever, as I promised David your father, saying, There shall not fall on you to have a man upon the throne of Israel. But if you turn away from following me, you or your children and will not keep my commandments and my statutes, which I have set before you, but go on and serve other gods and worship them, then I will cut Israel off from the land which I have given them, and this house I have hallowed for my name renowned, I will cast from my sight, and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all the peoples. Heavy stuff there. This house shall become a heap of ruins. Every passerby shall be astonished, and, this, and, and shall hiss with surprise and say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Then they will, they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have laid hold of other gods and has worshipped and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought them on all this evil. You ever wonder why you go through some things in life and we want to say, oh, well, God's just trying me. Look at the sin in your life. Could I get absolutely adamant about this right now? You're darn right. I could scream right through that camera. I could scream right through that camera. Then they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and have laid hold of other gods. Other gods. And have worshipped and served them. You see, when you break the integrity rule, when you don't keep His precepts, when you don't keep His statutes, when you don't keep His commandments, all one and the same, you are serving another God. Serving another God. And at some point in time, God has to say, I've had enough. We see it all the way through Scriptures. We see it all the way through Scripture. Serve the Lord thy God with all your heart is what you're supposed to do. But we have example after example after example when people got away from the covenant, when they refused to come out of their sin, God just has to eventually go... He hasn't blessed it for a while anyway because he can't get involved with it, and sooner or later it just falls apart. He just lets the whole thing go. And they will answer, because they forsook the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and have laid hold of other gods, and have worshipped and served them. Therefore the Lord has brought all this evil on them. You see, he even told them what was going to happen. He told them, you know, what they were going to say. And we should be able to relate this to absolute today. Because it hasn't changed. God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Yesterday, today, and forever. 
You see, if you just do what God wants you to do, God will cover you. God will cover you. Because that's how the 91st Psalm gets enacted. You see the pattern now? It's not just, oh, I want to keep the 91st Psalm. I'm, I'm, I'm going to reach over there. I want this. And then I'm going to go out here and I'm going to worship other gods and think that this 91st Psalm is going to uphold me. And you can get into worshiping other gods. We're going to talk about that in a minute because that's some serious stuff here. Because somewhere along the line, some people think, and they've elevated Jesus Christ as God. Does he sit on the throne? With the Father. Who did he pray to while he was on the face of the earth? The Father. But we think that what? God died, Jesus Christ took over? No, he is our lawyer. He's our lawyer. He's interceding for us. Who's he interceding to? Between him, us, and the Father. He's our lawyer. He takes our case. Hey, Father, look what they're doing. Hey, God, look what they're doing. They're asking forgiveness. That's his role. That's what he said he was going to do. And that's what he does. But you go to churches and you don't even hear the name of Jesus Christ or the name of God. Everything is about Jesus. Is there anything wrong with Jesus? No, absolutely not. That's not what I'm saying. It's about balance and it's about keeping Jesus in the role in which He was assigned and not elevating Him to the Father level. He prayed to the Father. He prayed to the Father. We are supposed to what? Pray to the Father in His name. In the name of Yeshua. In the name of Jesus Christ. That's what Scripture says to do. But we don't hear that. We hear, dear Jesus. No, the prayer goes to the Father in the name of. The Father's still on the throne. The Father's still running the show. And the Father is the one that's fighting this thing with darkness. That's what's going on. That is what's going on. And then you get Brother Judah over here on the other side. They've got it out of balance too because, yeah, they've got God. they got the commandments, but they missed Yeshua. The nice thing is, God said one day, He says, He'll bring the two sticks together and they shall be one in my hand. The two sticks. What's the two sticks? The testimony of Jesus Christ, the commandments of God, brought together, bound together, grafted together, people grafted in, and the two sticks shall become one. All the tribes back together again. All back in unity. All back in one accord. That will be exciting times. That will be exciting times. You know, Brother Judah, they're not happy with us because what did we do? We stole their covenant. That's what they think. They think we stole their covenant. And then you got the, the Christians over here that aren't happy with us, with us either, thinking that we gave up Jesus Christ because we keep the commandments of God. No. We're just doing it the way they did in the book of Acts. We're living like they did in the book of Acts. They kept the commandments, they kept the law, all one and the same, Torah observant, and they had the testimony of Jesus Christ. See, what we're doing isn't new. It's very old. We're just doing it again. Finding those what? Foundations that were laid back there, dusting them off, bringing them forward, building on them, it's not new. People know, oh, you're doing something new. Oh, you've got to jump around from this to that to that to over to here. No. It's just bringing it back again, just like it's always been done. Dusted it off, and we're presenting it, repairing the breach. And that's who we are. You see, if we get into this stuff here, though, and people hear this message, it can be dangerous. Because it's, it's probably safer not to know. Because to know and to do not is sin. 
to hear it, to know that something's there, to, that something's right, something's, something's in, and, and not do it, you'd have been better off not knowing. At the same time, we've got an obligation and a responsibility to give everybody choice out there. Because God wants you to see what's in your heart by choice, but He also wants to see what's in your heart by the choices you make. And I've talked about it the other day, about you know, darkness tempting us, and He petitions the Father. Who wins when He goes up there? Does God say, I got you? Or does Satan say, I told you so? What is it with your walk? What, what is it? What, what happens there? Dangerous times. Dangerous times. You're going to get fed. And you're going to get fed enough to, to grow or to, or to stumble. And, you know, there's some people that this thing is right on their heels like a Mack truck. What? Because you have to get up and walk on your own at some point in time. Because the, God's never shut the truck off. It's always been in gear and it's always been moving forward. And there's some people who refuse to get up and walk. Who refuse to get up and pick up their cross and follow after Him. Refuse to pick up their destiny, what they were placed on the face of this earth for, and refuse to do it. And sooner or later, this thing is going to run them down. Time to pick it up. Time to pick it up. Time to pick it up. You see, either because what happens, oftentimes you'll find people just kind of spit and sputter through their entire life. Can never get any traction. Can't get anything going. Can't get anything on their feet. Always tripping over themselves. They fall down. They trip over every rock. Bang, up and down. It's called spitting and sputtering. It's called being on milk. And it's about getting to the point where we get into the meat. And you can partake of the meat. When you can be grounded, when you can get your balance. You can be led by the Father. That's His Word. That's His Word being enacted on the face of this earth. But how much Word do we act out? And how much of flesh or other gods do we act out? How much of His Word, how much of His, his statutes and His precepts do we act out? These are questions that we need to take a look at and we need to answer. Why? Because it's about integrity. It's about integrity. Integrity is everything. Integrity is something that takes a lifetime to build and within a split second you can lose all your integrity and you go back to the back of the line and it takes a long time to rebuild integrity because integrity is tied to trust. Integrity is tied to trust. You don't just go out here and because somebody says something you trust them. Somebody tells you to do something, you don't just do it. We talked about that. It takes integrity. Integrity is built as trust is built. But you have to start with integrity somewhere. I know Prophet, when he, he traveled, there was one time that they would show up, and they would show up, you know, the people would show up 30, 45 minutes late because it was, what, fashionable, fashionable to be late? They just thought they could stroll in at any time, and they 30, 45 minutes late, they're walking in. He's walking out. I would do the exact same thing. Without a doubt. You see, when, when, when I talk to, to ministers and, and we, we're training people, and we're, one of the first things that I talk to them about is integrity. And, and I talk to them about starting on time. Very rarely do you see me, very, very rarely, if we have a technical problem, that would be the only time that I am late. I start right on the nose. Why? Because you're praying into the moment. You're setting the spirit world in action for what? Five o'clock today, when we do this live. You're setting that into action so that they're prepared and they're doing something and then I'll, I'm just going to show up a little late. What kind of integrity is that in the spirit world? What are, you, what, what are they looking at you thinking? We've done all this work. We've been prepping for this. We've been battling over here, and then you just want to sit there and say, oh, I just want to have another sandwich. Integrity, consistency, trust. You see, those are things that we have to work at, maintain. Because one thing that everybody, everybody out there wants 
is they want to be able to demand on God's Word for God to show up on time when He needs them or when you need Him. You want to demand that. Oh, when the, the, the plagues come or the flus come or whatever it happens, any type of disaster. You want God there right on time for that, don't you? But you can't be on time? Really? Really? You're setting the spirit world in motion when you set a time. When you open up your mouth, they are starting to work. You want to talk about people who can bastardize their own ministry? That's why I'm so adamant about being on time. You're setting things in motion. Integrity. Integrity. Solomon had integrity. David had integrity. Solomon decided to cash his in, though. Why? You see, what was going on here? God was making covenant with Solomon. He was making a covenant with Solomon. Because when we accept a covenant, we are responsible to keep our side of that covenant. And what happens if you don't? Well, let me tell you that prophets have a sword, okay? It's got two sides. One will bless you and the other one will cut your ear off. Nobody likes to do that kind of stuff. But when you start compromising the Word of God and going against the Word of God, what do you expect? You expect everybody just to sit around and say, okay. <coughs> it's not okay. It's not okay. It's not okay to live in, in the curses of Deuteronomy 28. Somebody's got to stand up and say, hey, something's wrong. That's where the church lives, though. Somebody's got to have the fortitude to stand up and say it. I don't care about the emails that come in that are negative. I don't care about the thumbs down that goes on YouTube. you got to say what you got to say. you got to bring forth the Word of God in truth. That's part of integrity, regardless of what people think. It's called faith and faithfulness. To the Father, not trying to appease mankind or your flesh, where it's, oh, the easy way out. You see, God's got a plan for this whole thing. He had a plan back then, and He's got a plan now. And you know what He's got for your life? He's got an alternate plan because you could choose to buck and walk out any time. And He will raise somebody else up. He will raise somebody else up. He always has. He always has throughout Scripture. And you see, because it all falls on this generation. It all falls on us. If you look, if you haven't noticed, Peter and Paul are dead. Peter and Paul are dead. But we don't need them because we've got the God that they have. Same God. All their writings are great. Yes, Peter was given, what, the keys to the kingdom. But at the same time, we serve the same God. And that's why we're going to work the greater works that they couldn't work, and they, they didn't work. It wasn't time. But that's for this generation. Man, dads, mothers, women, and children. Exciting? Well, it doesn't sound so exciting right now. But that's what we're striving towards. We're striving towards bringing that in which God has put down in His Word and bringing it to life. Blossoming it. Letting the Word grow out of it into us. And we are that generation which will do those things that are written in the volume of the book. 2 Kings 24.1 This guy wasn't so nice. In his day, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, and Jehokanim became his servant for three years. Then he turned and rebelled against him. The Lord sent against Jehokanim bands of, of Chaldeans, of Syrians, of Moabites, and Ammonites. All sounds like all the ites. And he sent them against Judah to destroy it, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant, the prophets. Surely this came upon Judah at the command of the Lord to remove them 
out of his sight because of the sins of Manasseh according to all that he had done. Are you listening to this? And also for the innocent blood that he shed. For he filled Jerusalem with innocent blood and the Lord would not pardon. The Lord would not pardon. You see, what we're seeing here, you're seeing a a great shift in what we're talking about here. Jerusalem fell, went into the hands of Nebuchadnezzar. Why? Because they tried to do things their way. They tried to do things their way. They've got to be done God's way. They've got to be done the way that He has written in His Scripture. You see, but the church has done the exact same thing. God coveted to us, and He gave us choice. What choice have we made with that? No, we don't need that. No, don't need that. Well, by default, you're partaking of the curses that are there. You're calling me cursed? I said, no, you've chosen by the choices that you make, by not participating in the covenant that God set there, by default, you take the curses because you sure aren't taking the blessings. Well, it seems pretty good right now. Well, you wait. You wait. The heathen is still blessed down the street right now, too. You wait. 2 Kings 24.10 At that time, the servants of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up to Jerusalem, and the city was besieged. Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to the city while his servants were besieging it. Jehoiachin, king of Judah, surrendered to the king of Babylon. He, his mother, his servants, princes, and palace officials. The king of Babylon took him prisoner in the eighth year of Nebuchadnezzar's reign. He carried off all the treasures of the Lord's house and of the king's house and cut in pieces all the vessels of gold in the temple of the Lord, which Solomon, king of Israel, had made, as the Lord had said. He carried away all Jerusalem, all the princes, all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives, and all the craftsmen and smiths. None remained except the poorest of the land. That was it. That's the way it works with God. He said, here you go, you do this. If you don't, this is going to happen. What, is he a liar? Is he going to defile his own word? Oh, maybe just make a special exception for Solomon? No, it didn't happen. Everything was destroyed. Everything was taken down. But the people destroyed Israel. And just like Daniel has said, what did Daniel say? He said that because of the decisions that people are making, they bring the curse upon ourselves or upon themselves. We have brought the curse upon ourselves. Your choice. If you go on the Ephraim International YouTube channel, Mr. Ernest Jacobs is doing a series right now on defilement and and. It talks about there, he talks about we do it to ourselves. We do it to ourselves. And this is exactly what happens. We do it to ourselves by the decisions that we make. 2 Kings 24, 15. Nebuchadnezzar took captive to Babylon, king of Jehoiachin, his mother, his wives, his officials, and the chief and mighty men of the land. The prophet Ezekiel included, talked about that last week, when everybody went into captivity, everybody went into captivity, he took from Jerusalem to Babylon into, took from Jerusalem to Babylon into exile. And the king of Babylon, Babylon brought captive to, Bab, to Babylon all the men of valor, 7,000 and craftsmen and smiths, 1,000 all strong and fit for war. And the king of Babylon made Metanea, Jehoiachin's uncle, king in his stead, and changed his name to Zedekiah. You see, these things are real. These things are real. Our God is real. And when God says something, He means it. When we have gotten away from the covenants of God over the eras of time, right back to the time of creation, to the time that they were given, and the covenant started with God, if you upheld your end, the, 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 the same covenant, God's upholding His side. You'll be okay. 
But we get on this teeter-totter thing where God's trying to uphold His end, and we jump off the teeter-totter and we smash Him to the ground. And He can't do anything. Stay on your side. Keep it in balance. Do what you've got to do, and the thing can be level where your walk needs to be. Because you're including the covenant, you're including Jesus Christ on the other side, and you're sticking to it, and you're staying in balance and staying in your position. Chasing after your flesh, you're going to get off that teeter-totter and run after your flesh and crash, there it goes again. God can't do anything now. And then we come back and we decide we want to get back on the teeter-totter. Well, then we've got to build a little bit of integrity with God. We've got to build a little bit of trust again. We've got to go through some purposes of temptation because we've got to see what it's in our heart and we've got to prove to ourselves what's in our heart. It's all circular. It's all circular. And over the eras of time, it's always been circular. We've got the, co the co covenants. We've gotten away from them. Penalty comes. Punishment comes. Got the covenant again. Go through this process. And here we are. We're about to get the covenant again out to the world. And this is the doctrine of the Father. That's the doctrine of the Father. And look at the blessings that can come. When you are doing the bidding of God and you are putting out the doctrine of God, when you are taking the testimony and you're taking the covenant and you're putting it out there to the world, administering to people, it doesn't have to be in a room full of people. Sometimes it's a phone call. Sometimes it's putting your arm around somebody. Some people like to do street ministry. Some people like to knock on doors. It's about getting the word around there. They never had internet, but they got Jesus Christ's testimony around the face of the earth, eh? Disciples did a pretty good job of that. There's not too many people on the face of this earth who haven't heard Jesus Christ. They never had internet. They never had airplanes. They never had emails. But part of the quick work in the end time? Possibly. Possibly. But God says He's going to purpose the heart of man too. He's going to purpose the heart of man. When they hear the message that you want to bring forth, their heart is going to leap and jump. And then they've got choices to make. Stay where they're at or pick up your cross. Or pick up your cross and follow after the true God upstairs. The way that He wants to be served, doing it His way. It's not about following a man. It's not about following me. It's about being led led in the things of the Father. And you get out of line, yeah, God's got people in the face of this earth that kind of shuffle the papers and make sure that they're straightened back up again. That's what it's about. He has always had His prophets to do that. He's always had His prophets to do that. 2 Kings 25.9 <coughs> He burned the house of the Lord the king's house, and all the houses of Jerusalem. Every great house he burned down. And the army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the of Babylonian guard broke down the walls around Jer Jerusalem. Jumped over, down to 13. The bronze pillars in the Lord's house and its bases and all the bronze uh, sea, the Chaldean, Chaldeans smashed and carried the bronze to Babylon. And they took away the pots, shovels, Snuffers, dishes for incense, all the bronze vessels used in the temple service, the fire pans and bowls, such things as were of gold, the captain of the guard took away as gold. And what was of silver, he took away as silver. The two pillars, the one sea and the bases which Solomon had made in the house of the Lord, the bronzes and all the articles was incalculable. Incalculable. The funny thing is, when God was there in the temple, they used to tie a rope around the ankle. They'd walk in there, and if the guy died, they'd drag him out. Why? Because the presence of God was there. Yet these guys here are sitting here pillaging the whole thing, destroying it all. All these things that were consecrated, all the utensils that were used, were all consecrated. And here they're just carrying them out, destroying them. Nothing happened. Why? You think God was still there? God cannot participate in your sin. As an individual, God cannot participate in the sin of a nation. And God sure as heck 
can't participate in the sin of the church. And standing up there and telling people that they don't have to keep the commandments of God, because this is what they're telling them. When you're saying you don't have to keep the covenants of God, when you don't have to keep the law, you're saying you don't have to keep the commandments of God. That's what's going on. You think that makes God happy? No. That's why it's dying. That's why it's dying on the vine. That's why it's dying on the vine. You see, we get into the third temple. The third temple will be built. And that is not going to be a spiritual temple as most of the church believes. That is a physical temple. Just like the land that he gave us, our forefathers, that's where we're going back the land that He gave our forefathers. He didn't give our forefathers a spiritual land. He gave them a physical land. And He says we're going back there. First, He says, I'm going to draw the tents of Judah back first. He did that in 1948. And then He's going to be bringing back Ephraim, the ten lost tribes. He's going to gather them up and He's going to bring them back. When? I don't know. How? I don't know. It hasn't been revealed yet. But we're going back. We're going back. Well, how do you know that? Well, how do you know you're getting to heaven? Because it's written in the volume of the book. It's written in the volume of the book. You just got to know that you know that you know. You set your heart to it like Flint. And you chase after God like you've set your heart to Him like Flint. And it's not that difficult to go. You see, but the ancestors, they knew long ago, don't mess with our God. And then you get sects of religion out here that know, that know what happened in the history of time when they came against our God, what happened to them. Don't mess with the children of the Almighty God. And that's why I opened up talking about we are all children of the Almighty God. You know, see, you desecrate their God and what happens? They get all upset. They desecrate our gods and nobody, no, our God, nobody says a word. That'll change. That will change. But all they want to do is destroy the infidels off the face of this earth. And anybody who will not be one of them, does that sound like what, the way our God is? He gives us choice. But it's choice. Not because of fear, not because of consequence. Because of love is why we make choice. Do you love God? But no, you expect Him to love you? We've got to love God by the choices that we made. Talk is cheap. A lot of people talk thunder. What about the lightning? What about the action in your life? Well, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna. Well, I'm gonna, and you're gonna die saying, well, I'm going to. Be a doer. Not just a hearer, be a doer of the Word. Pick up your cross and follow after me. Just pick up your cross and do it. Not that hard. Not that hard. Well, I don't know where my cross is. I don't know. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. Push the plate back. Push the plate back. 2 Chronicles 36, 14. Also the chief of the priests and all the people trespassed greatly in in a court with all the abominations of the heathen. And they polluted the house of the Lord which He had hallowed in Jerusalem. And the Lord, the God of their fathers, sent them persistently by His messengers because He had compassion on His people and on His dwelling place. See, what did He do? He sent His prophets. His messenger are His prophets. But then we got a whole entity out here of, of, of church that doesn't believe that God's going to bring judgment. And they don't even see the sin that they're walking in. They don't see the sin that they're walking in. It's not okay to go live like the world out there six days a week and then show up and sit in a pew. It's not okay to go out there and sin all week. 
come there Sunday, ask forgiveness, turn around and start doing the same thing the next day. You know, how, how many times do you want to crucify Jesus for your sin? How many times would you want to be crucified for somebody else's sin? You'd be like, I, I died for that already. I, I, do I, I've got to go through that again? Unrepentant sin. You're really not sorry because you haven't changed. That's what happens with people like that. They haven't changed. And I'm not pointing a finger at the, the people that are here today. I'm looking at the fact that there's going to be a whole nation that we've got to go out there and find, and you're going to run into this all the time. Put those bullets in your gun because you're going to need them. Those are, are, are weapons of word that you can bring forth to people and utilize it on them. Why? To get them to straighten out so they, they can see within their own heart, within their own mind, through their own eyes. Because you're not going to scream or, or yell at somebody into submission. It never has worked in the eras of time. What you want them to do is look inside themselves and look unto their God and look into the Word and find it for themselves and come to their own realization because now you've got a winner. Now you've got a winner. But you're not going to argue somebody into submission, scream and yell at them because they're wrong. It, it's never worked. Sometimes we get compliance because they just want to get away from the situation. And they go right back to doing what they were doing. They haven't changed. Nothing in there has changed. You see, but you, this whole thing, you look back, and a lot of this, the warnings, the warnings, the warnings. I want to read that again. And the Lord God, their fathers, sent to them persistently by His messengers because they, He had compassion on Him and His people and on His dwelling place. Compassion. God had compassion. You see, I want to talk about something here for a second. Back in the times when they, they took the prayer out of school. And I don't think anybody realizes how devastating that truly was when they took the prayer out of the school. That opened up things like violence, gun violence, massacres. And let me tell you something else. All kinds of sexual sins. It opened up the doors for all of that to come in. As soon as they took that out, the door was open, and they just walked right in. And now you're seeing it really, really, really take off in the last decade or so. And now the biggest thing that happened there, homosexuality came in at that point in time into the schools, and it came into the kids. And here we are generations later. And what a disgrace we have out here in the school. To the point that you don't even want to send your kids to school. You see, we want to send kids to school mostly because parents don't want to do the work or they've got to go to work or something like that. And they're using it as a babysitter. But there is more sin in those schools than that parent will face at work that day probably. And you're asking your child to take on that burden, that which you won't do, Take on that burden of all that force coming at them. You see, you wouldn't stand your child in front of an army and say, okay, you go fight, I'm going to be over here. But you'll do that because you can't see into the spirit world and what's going on. You can't see the damage. You can't see what they're absorbing. You can't see the, 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 the mindset that they get into because of the things that they're constantly bombarded by. It's like watching the, same, the wrong TV show over and over and over and over. That's what it's like for them. And then we expect them to come out perfect? What about removing yourself from the sin? Is it easy? No. Will we have our own education system? Listen to me, Ephraim. Oh, yes, we will. Yes, we will. Maybe it's a curriculum that you teach at home. Maybe it's an online courses. Maybe you teach part of it at home yourselves. Maybe they can jump online for something. We will have an education system. 
that will be holy, righteous, and pleasing to the Father to save our kids from the abomination that's going on out here in the schools. And it all started back when they took out prayer. One more verse, and then we're going to wrap this thing up. 2 Chronicles 36, 16. But they kept mocking the messengers of God and despising His words and scoffing at, at His prophets till the wrath of the Lord rose up against His people till there was no remedy or healing. Till there was no remedy or healing. You know, it says in the Scripture, touch not my anointed and do my prophets no harm. What'd they do? They did harm. They did harm. They wouldn't listen. They did harm. But there was no remedy or healing. You see, no remedy. No remedy. No remedy means either you've blasphemed the Holy Ghost or you've been turned over to a reprobate mind because there's no remedy for those two things. You cannot come back from being turned over to a reprobate mind and you cannot come back from blaspheming the Holy Ghost. And the wrath of the Lord rose up against His people till there was no remedy or healing. Serious stuff? Our God means business. You're going to about to see God stand up and you're going to see God rise up because of the great sins in which we walk. But we will be the repairer of the breach. We will show people to how to patch the gaps, the infractions within their life. We will bring that forward so that people can get back in right standing with God. And this is what it is all about. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask you to bless the people that are out here, Father. We ask to bless this message as it goes forth over the airwaves for as long as it's out there, Father. Let them receive. Let them receive. Let them extract from it your words, Father. Your examples that you've laid out in Scripture. We ask that you bless these people. Bless them in, the, in their walk, Father. Bless them in their journey. Open their eyes. Give them eyes to see and ears to hear. Let the scales fall off. Father, let the anointing grow within the lives of your servants. Let your, the anointing grow within the lives of every man, woman, and child who will stand Stick to it. Who will have integrity. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Enjoy your week, everybody.